All right, what's going on YouTube? How's everyone been? Hope you guys have been well. Um, I haven't made a video in a while, so I figured, you know what, it's time to stop being lazy and get out there and do something. Um, I've been struggling to put some videos together. Um, trying to put together some more, I don't know, training valuable uh, learning content, if you will. Um, something that somebody can hopefully watch and gain something out of it. <clears throat> um, I know I do just from my own personal experience with these cars. So if I'm learning something, I'm sure someone else can gather something out of it. The good, the bad, the ugly, whatever. Okay. Um, great movie, by the way. What was I going to say? Okay. So this vehicle that I had was a 2018, um, Chevy Equinox, uh, Chevy Equinox, okay, now they put this 1.5 liter LIX platform engine, it's a direct injection engine, um, it's GM's newer, it would be a newer engine, I guess you could say, um, turbocharged, now, they've had a lot of issues with these 1.5s, or at least I've been, I've been seeing it with the lower mileage, um, the newer ones um, have been updated, but they have a lot of intercooler issues, um, especially in, uh, with the cold climates. When you start getting below um, ambient temps of 32 degrees, which is freezing um, Fahrenheit, of course, <clears throat> the intercoolers will like to freeze um, due to the moisture from um, the PCV system, which is your positive crankcase ventilation system. Um, now the, the PCV valve on these is under the intake, uh, or under the intake is under the valve cover and to just rem to remove the valve cover on these is like almost, I want to say like seven hours, um, to do, which is just insane. Right. Um, but I think on the newer ones, from what I understand, they've addressed that issue with, um, some of the, um, older ones had issues with the PCVs and they, I think they've modified that and updated that as far as I know. And a lot of this was done under warranty, um, special claims and stuff like that. Um, with the intercooler issue, now I'm not sure why, um, again, I'm not an engineer by any means and I'm certainly not an expert um, in every aspect of automotive, but um, these intercoolers on these, they don't run like a shutter system. Now some um, we've seen have uh, have a type of shutter door, but it's like a thermostatic um, you know, as it gets warmer or, or whatever, it springs open. And then as it, you know, gets colder, it, it's supposed to drop. Well, the problem in colder climates is, you know, you have dirt, road debris, stuff like that. And they, they don't slide. Now, why they didn't go to like what Ford uses, um, and even GM has some vehicles that have actual actuators that move the shutters. Um, and if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, you know, they'll run like a, like a door, like, um, it almost looks like, uh, like blinds on a window. Right. And they put an actuator motor on there to actually open those shutters to allow more airflow through the intercooler or the radiator or whatever. Right. And then when they want to reduce that airflow, um, the, the actuator motor will close the doors. Why they didn't do that on this platform. I have no idea. Okay. Um, so what they've done is they've put out bulletins to run a winter grill cover, which is basically just a little like vinyl bra that the customer is supposed to snap on over the little vents on the very bottom of the bumper there um, whenever they're towing um, or when ambient temps are dropping below freezing. The problem I see with that um, is you're putting more... <laughs> I mean, customers out there and anyone who works in the automotive industry knows this. Um, 
they don't even, not all, but the vast majority of them are not checking their oil regularly like they should. Like in the older car, you know, the older days, um, people would check their oil more frequently. On newer cars, it's just as important, okay? Because the PCV systems on these newer cars are running more and more, um, are ha are see we're seeing more and more issues with the PCV systems because, you know, of emissions. Um, they're not dumping piece, uh, crankcase gases and vapor onto the into the atmosphere. They're putting it back through the intake, and that causes a lot of drivability problems, such as valve coking, um, throttle bodies getting coked up. Uh, all kinds of problems, right? Um, and especially when you add a turbocharger into the mix, um, now we're running all that stuff through a turbocharger on the fresh air side. And, okay, so we get oil consumption problems, boost problems, cracked intercoolers, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, frozen throttle bodies, all kinds of crazy um, drivability problems. Now, on this particular case study, that wasn't the case, okay? So this was a... Um, had came in for a P0172 uh, fuel trim rich um, code and I put together some videos just some short video clips of uh, me pulling in uh, you know I didn't get the the diagnosis part filmed and I apologize for that um, that's why I'm making this part uh, but I did capture the repair portion a part of the repair, um, I was able to get an, um, an ohms check done on the injectors. Um, it wasn't, um, I did do a flow test on those injectors and I'll share some of those photos and those, vi and those video clips with you guys. Um, you know, time is of the essence and I'm, I'm, I, you know, I work for the dealership, so it's like, I can't be filming while I'm working, um, for long periods of time. Now I do film, um, a lot of times I'll film my data as I'm going through it because it's nice as a reference when I'm writing my stories and my causes and 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 so forth okay um so for that portion if I can capture that and somehow you know get enough information I'll put together a video out there um that's that's kind of what I've been trying to do it's just difficult piecing it all together um given I've been focused on um, and I'm not trying to give you guys excuses. I'm just giving you some insight as to why. Um, I, I've been doing my GM training, and there is a lot that I have to get done. Um, I have to move here again. <laughs> I've moved like three times in the last year, and it's just been stressful, especially with children. So with all that being said, let's um, get into this. Um, it came, Like I said, it came. this car came in um with this for a check engine complaint now the customer said it ran fine i can tell you right now this car did not run fine it wasn't it was running fine to them but when i'm looking at it as a technician i can tell you this car was not running fine um it was running extremely rich um once the engine would get up to temp um the trims would be maxed out um, negatively, um, like negative 30 on our long term with like, a, you know, and then trying to still pull fuel away on the on the short term side when we're looking at fuel trims. So um, why that was the case was because um, fuel was getting down into our crankcase um, because of an inject because of these injectors. And these injectors like to coke up. Um, they don't spray right. Um, they may spray too much. They may have flow issues um, because they are direct injection. So they're going directly into the combustion chamber and they're exposed to high compression. Um, they're exposed to combustion. And um, like I said, uh, you've got all that on the intake side of it where the air is drawn in through the intake side, you're, you're getting um, EGR gases, you're not, your, your nitrous oxides, your... Um, carbon monoxide, um, your hydrocarbons, whatever, right? You're getting all them gases, that oil, all that nast that's coming in with, um, you know, the variable valve timing, as well as trying to inject fuel. Um, there's a lot going on in these direct injection engines. And then you add a turbocharger on top of that, which is putting boost pressure, um, you know, when you're under, uh, under load and you're boosting, these injectors take a beating, okay? I don't know what the fix is. However, my opinion, <clears throat> take it for what it's worth, is that GM has top tier um, engine cleaner, okay? 
if I were to buy one of these platforms brand new, um, I would recommend, you know, whether it be every other oil change or maybe every three oil changes, um, maybe you go off mileage, it doesn't matter, right? Um, because they're running a synthetic oil, I would just suggest maybe like every two oil changes running a top tier through the injector rail um, and maybe even running it through the intake as well to help clean the valves um, and to help clean the injectors. Now, when I worked at the previous shop that I worked at, we had um, a Valvoline um, induction service um, GDI injector service kit. And I think I made a video a while back. I'll link it in this description of me performing this on a Chevy pickup. Uh, and these direct injection engines, <clears throat> it really makes a big difference providing you catch it um, right, you know, you start the process right away. Um, you know, you can help keep, uh, prevent, slow down, I should say, valve coking issues, valve seating issues, um, uh, spray issues on your direct, in, you know, your injectors because of those um, injectors have to spray just right. I mean, you you got those six little machined holes in the tip of that injector, and when they carbon up and you don't get that one spray um, when you should have all six and you only have five that are spraying, your cone, your nice cone pattern and your atomization of the fuel are going to be affected. Um, and, and it could be as something as simple as the injector itself sticking. Um, you know, like, for example, a 3.6, um, GM 3.6 with a fully stuck open injector seen it um and you'll know because it, it will bell out white smoke out the tailpipe okay and misfire and whatever so you know cat failures um trim issues um direct injection is going to add a big variable to that this is something that you wouldn't catch with an ohm meter by ohming out the injectors this is something that you probably ain't going to catch by doing let's say an amperage measurement on them um or it can you know as far as i have seen the only real way to get these things pinpointed once you've ruled out like, you know, certain inputs such as mass airflow, um, maybe you have a skewed mass airflow or dirty mass airflow. Um, maybe you have um, an actual vacuum leak issue or some kind of boost leak or whatever the case may be, right? Um, once you've factored all those out, um, leaking down, um, Another issue would be like a leaking uh, plunger on the um, uh, high pressure fuel pump or your injection pump. There again, um, if the vehicle sits a lot, um, that seal in there might not get lubricated properly and you end up with fuel vapor uh, or you know fuel draining down into the crankcase. And again, you can change the oil as a temporary fix. It, it prevents them vapors from coming up and you know basically causing a rich condition but you're not actually fixing what's causing the problem. And the only fix for that a lot of times is unfortunately to replace. Now, with this particular case study, I had three injectors that were have that were showing signs of flow issues when I hooked up the um, active fuel injector tester by Kent Moore, which is an actual um, flow rate test equipment. Highly, very expensive, of course, but um, not every shop out there not every technician is going to have this equipment available to them now scan tools do give you the option to do what's called a um, like an automated injector balance test okay on these direct injection engines now you can use that as a guide unfortunately I have seen those tests mislead you and think oh well I don't know I'm not quite sure if these things are having balance issues um, it can often mask it because it doesn't pulse the injectors directly and actually command them um, the same way. It's more like a disable injector, look for RPM drop, almost like a power balance test versus an actual flow test. Now, I think on the scan tools, don't quote me because I'm not 100% sure, but I have seen some on um, these uh, that automated uh, injector flow test on the scan tools that do actually read um, and kind of give you values uh, based on what the rail pressure sensor is seeing for a drop on each injector. That's great, um, but you know, in either case, you got to kind of, you know, th there is a spec, for example, and the spec is 
usually they, they're, they're saying that anywhere from plus or minus um, 10% on the injector is acceptable. Now I'm gonna tell you on this one, you'll see this, I would have been within spec, but it wouldn't have fixed the problem. Like just, um, you know, maybe uh, I could have tried an injector clean. I had suggested that, um, but I haven't seen much success once the injectors are having flow issues to try to run a cleaner through them to kind of correct the issue, if that makes sense. Um, you almost got to start running the cleaner ahead of time to keep them them nozzles nice and clean because once they start having flow issues, you know, the damage is kind of already done. So hope that makes sense. Let's get into the actual um, video um, and I'll share with you guys um, what I found on this, okay? I ran the active fuel injector tester, okay? So what you're looking at here is the test results, all right? Um, for those of you not familiar with this tool, what this tool essentially does is it has a control box um, and it has, obviously, it gets updated similar to like a scan tool gets updated with new, you know, newer years, new makes, new models, um, and, and, and so forth, okay? Um, but it has an actual box that with adapters that um, you can actually disconnect the harness, uh, you know, your X1, X2, X3 uh, connectors at your PCM will actually be disconnected. And then there's an adapter that, uh, that the tool comes with for, you know, every different type of PCM for GM that you can actually plug into and essentially the tool takes over to be able to um, directly uh, flow do a flow test on these injectors and and get accurate test results um, on their flow rates and it displays this um, it'll actually do a leak down test too so what you're looking at there is the fuel rail leakage test results and what it's telling you is is that the high pressure side passed however if you look at that data it says started um when it started its test it was at 1203 psi okay um the tool runs you through you know cranking it to build that pressure up and it kind of like it pulses everything to like stabilize the pressure um gets a good accurate base point and then it measures you know over a certain period of time that drop um, and you can see the drop value there of 44 PSI. Now, I believe that that is our injectors that were actually leaking down or, you know, like a couple of them may have actually been leaking a bit. And that's why we've seen that pressure drop. Um, however, it's saying on the tool that that's a pass, okay? Now, <clears throat> on the low pressure side of that fuel system, um, you can see that it started with um, 282 PSI with a zero PSI drop. Now, I know for a fact um, the low side fuel pressure, you know, is not going to be 282 PSI. So I'm not quite sure um, what their, um, I'm, what am I trying to say? I'm not quite sure what their, their, their method behind their madness is here. 100% guys because I'm fairly new to this tool um, but the fact that it tells me my low pressure and my high pressure are a pass I'm not um, and again I wasn't too concerned about fuel pressure to begin with um, the high pumps on these particular um, engines they don't um, sit with the plunger um, what am I trying to say, facing down towards the crankcase, they actually sit at an angle upwards and right off the cam lobe that drives the um, piston on the high injection pump. So for it to leak into the crankcase on this particular platform is gonna be a lot less likely, in my honest opinion, I, you know, don't quote me, I mean, I'm saying nothing, anything is possible, but the chance of a leak down on this high pump, maybe that's why they, they run them in that orientation is a lot less in my personal opinion than let's say uh, a V8 Chevy that's got it underneath the intake and it's facing directly down um, 
you know, right down towards the crank. Okay. If that makes sense. <clears throat> okay. So anyways, I wasn't worried about high side pressure. I wasn't worried about low side pressure leak down. Um, there is a little bit of high pressure leak down there. And I believe that is the injector. So now if we look at our next test result screen, um, what you're going to look at here is our actual balance test results. Um, and this is a percentage from averaged flows on each injector. Now, because this tool knows what um, engine platform we're working with, it automatically labels our injector flow rates for us and you can um, for which cylinder is which. So if you look at cylinder one there, you can see that we were running uh, um, it. The percentage was negative 0.3. Um, in other words, the, the injector is almost damn near perfect because zero would be a perfect value. I misspoke there, but if you look down at the bottom, it does give you our spec um, of minus 15% to positive 15%. Now to me personally, based on my experience, that is a very wide range for a spec. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't, I, I, I don't agree with that. Um, I'm not sure why they give you that wide of a range. Um, you know, maybe somebody knows the answer to that, but me personally, if I see any value um, greater than one or two, um, negative or, or, or positive, and I have a fuel trim issue, I mean, we're going, I'm, I'm, I'm going with, uh, you know, the injector has an issue. They should be relatively balanced, okay? Especially on these engines, in my opinion. Yeah, there you can also see they give us our engine coolant temp um, of 149 degrees. So I wasn't quite warmed up. It took me a while to set this tool up because every time you set it up, it's it's a little different. Um, some of them you have to, you know, pull fuses and bypass um, starter circuits and stuff to get the tool to work properly. But um, especially when you're dealing with start-stop, this was a start-stop um, technology or, you know, vehicle. Um, so ideally, I like to run injector flow tests when the injectors are good and hot, um, depending, because it depends on if, like, I'm attacking something with freeze frame data that indicates the issue is happening when it's cold versus when it's hot. In this particular case, the freeze frame data indicated that this, you know, the problem was more prevalent when the vehicle was warm. So I'm not quite up to full temp there. Wouldn't think, overthink it. Um, but I'm, I'm still warm. Okay. I'm not, I'm not exactly cold. You can see, um, injector two's results was negative 3.6%. Um, that's one of the injectors, obviously that I'm definitely concerned about. Um, cylinder threes is positive 2%. Um, and then cylinder fours is negative 1.6. So uh, clearly there's an imbalance on those three injectors. Um, one, yes, we could make the argument that it doesn't need a number one injector. However, this was a warranty issue. Um, I don't want the customer coming back again. Um, and it's been my experience that when you have injector flow problems, um, you know, I'm just one of those guys that's like, you know, if you got four of them and three out of the four are showing issues, the other one is questionable, okay, despite my test results. To each their own, but if I'm selling labor to go in there, um, I'm just going to recommend that we do them all and get a nice, good balance restored again. Um, you know, and some might have issue with that, um, you know, cool story. All right. Um, cylinder five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So you can see this, this tests up to 10, 10 cylinders. Okay. Um, obviously those are open because we are dealing with a four cylinder engine. Okay. So there's the test results from that. Um, there's also another screen they give you and they kind of just graph it for you. Um, just another way for you to look at the, um, test results in a different manner. I suppose this is primarily if like you were going to print the results. Okay. Um, but you can see the little bars there on cylinders two, three, and four and showing that they are in fact having flow problems. Um, now again, like I said, you know, when it comes to warranty, sometimes they're kind of picky on this. Um, they'd be like, well, that's technically within specification. Well, okay, cool story. Well then we'll only do the ones that you're going to pay for. 
and then um, when it doesn't fix the vehicle you'll just pay that warranty time again for us to go in there and do the other um, you know the other injectors that you didn't want to do the first time um, don't matter to me as the technician because I get paid the same regardless so um, you know it is what it is you know you make your recommendations you tell them what you think and what you're seeing and what you've tested and you go with it okay so there's that um, I hope you guys found that you know helpful I mean again it's not a video of me actually testing it would I have liked to have been able to do that yeah but it took me you know I was still learning how to set this one five up on this tool um, again I'm new to this just like everyone else so it's not like I'm you know gonna be Johnny on the spot right away this is my first one I've ever done a flow test on with this tool um, so I kind of ate some of the time here but not really because it's 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 warranty time um, doesn't justify taking more time, but it's like, you know, hey, training sometimes is done when you're in the moment. So next time I'll be a lot more proficient at it. Um, that makes sense. Um, but you don't want to shortchange yourself either. You know, they, I think they give you like 1.4 to do a balance test. I think that's book time for them, one and a half, somewhere in there. Um, you know, utilize your time wisely, um, but use your time, you know, like, if you can do it in a half an hour, cool story, but, you know, they're giving you that time, and if you're one of those guys that likes to put your punches right at, you know, uh, short, um, for one, you're, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot if you catch my drift, and you're shooting other technicians in the foot on that. So let's keep our times right on the money, if you know what I'm saying. Anyways... <clears throat> Uh, moving on okay so in this next video I made a video of me um, just basically talking about the special tool that is required to pull this inject these injectors out now <clears throat> disclaimer before you get all crazy upset and drop comments down you can pull them without the special tool and this and that cool story um, I'm going to utilize what's available to me, okay? This rail assembly on these are um, a little bit different than most of them. Um, is there a way to get them apart without using the special tool? I'm very sure somebody's going to find a workaround on this, okay? What I'm getting at here, uh, kind of the point of this video is for one it's kind of cool to use the actual tools recommended by service information so that was kind of a bonus there um two at least now you can see what the tool looks like um i wasn't able to show me necessarily setting it up and actually slamming the rail out okay it came out relatively easy with the tool what i wanted to do is just show you it um, and explain the costs for some of these specialty tools to hopefully enlighten maybe a customer out there to why it costs a lot of money to diagnose cars and why it costs a lot of money to repair them, especially on these newer platforms because there's special tools involved. Um, the time it takes us to um, diagnose the problem, there's so many variables. Um, we as technicians are trying to keep up with technology as fast as we can. We're only getting given a certain amount of training um, and we got to you know, sometimes think outside the box a little bit. Needless to say, <clears throat> what I'm getting at is, is do, you know, manufacturers don't, the reason they want you to use special tools on this pro platform, in my opinion, would be a safety issue. Because you're running, you're running upwards of 2,000 PSI, sometimes even more than that on these direct injection engines. Um, they don't want fuel leaks, especially considering the coils, the ignition coils, sit right by where all the, the ceiling points are for these injectors. So if you pry on stuff and try to get it out without the special tool, there's a good chance you could tweak something and maybe something won't seat right. And it don't take much. And then you got a fuel leak going down the highway. And what happens if, God forbid, a spark were to arc out of one of the ignition coils or whatever you got yourself a fire hazard there okay um it's kind of like the intermediate the fuel feed pipe from your high pump to the rail they want you to replace that because those fittings are a one-time 
one-time deal. They get torqued, um, and anytime they're removed, they're supposed to be replaced. Now, I have... I have put them back on just to pull the vehicle out and I've seen them not leak after retorquing them. But the manufacturers and stuff don't want anyone taking any risks when it involves safety. Um, because there again, you don't want a customer's car to start on fire. Um, I mean, that's kind of a big deal. Okay. So I'm not out here advocating one way or the other. What I'm saying is, is do the job correctly you should have the correct tools to do the job. Are there workarounds? Of course there are. There's always a workaround. Um, take it for what it's worth. So here's the video. So I'm about to pull this injector rail on this 1.5 liter GM fine product using our special kit here, which is an EN-51146 made by Bosch. We got her all installed because the injectors live down there. There's the rest of the kit. How much do you think that tool costs? So do they want you working on your own cars anymore? I don't know, but I don't think he'd want to attempt to pull this rail without it. Pretty sure a lot of things would be bent and broken. Anyways. They had it tied down. And uh, what do you want? Some money. What money? I just see it. You want my wallet? No. Well, wherever the money is, yeah. That would be where my money is. Then you just give me your wallet. We dropped something. What was that? What are you doing? There you go. Oh, this really? It's like a time. That is not the agreement. Oh yeah, I didn't know there was agreement. <laughs> Ridiculous. Okay, so, you know, I'm not saying you can't take this rail out without this special tool. However, you know, I'm working on it for a warranty job, so I'm using the special tool. Now, does that mean there isn't a workaround does that mean that there's not ways to get it out of there without this special tool? Absolutely not. I'm sure there is. However, I will say, be careful, because if you bend um, these tubes, as you can see in the um, diagram I'm showing you here, uh, those little tubes that run down, those feed tubes that run down from the rail are pre-bent to their specific position, um, and then the injector, um, if you look right there, um, item number one is our actual set screw. Okay, item number one there is our uh, torque to yield screw that holds the injector to an actual rail assembly, okay? Um, number two, item number two there is part of the toolkit, and there's going to be um, two per injector, so eight total of that tool there. Um, and they screw down in place... They basically replace uh, item number one, the screws, the, the holding screws. Um, and they come, as you can see, they come up. And if we look at the um, plate that rests on top there that the two slide hammers screw into, you'll see those machined holes where um, another eight different bolts will, it, it basically sets on top of those those struts or those supports and then everything screws down the plate screws down so it holds those that injector rail assembly nice and sturdy and holds the injectors and then the two hammers are made to are designed to pull evenly and equally on everything at once to snap them out of there so you know this is a fairly new engine so um, very low mileage i think this one only had like uh, I want to say maybe 30, not even 30,000 miles on it. So everything slid apart really nice. You get an older engine, you know, as time goes on, those injectors are going to be baked into that head a lot more. So don't really know. Um, I haven't seen one with high mileage. Maybe somebody out there has, um, but it's, you know, a fairly new engine. So even if it's high miles on the highway, uh, you know, that isn't age. Okay, age is what's really going to matter. Um, nevertheless, you can see here, I just got some pictures of the um, assembly removed. Um, 
you know, I just wanted to kind of show what it looks like. <clears throat> um, again, I apologize. I didn't get all the um, actual removal. Uh, it, nothing too spectacular, guys. You hold the two slide hammers and then just give her a few taps, and it didn't take much, and the whole assembly pops right out. Then, of course, you just remove your um, t holding tool. You know, you got to be careful when you're doing that as well. Um, because you don't want to be tweaking stuff around. So, you know, it's important to hold everything with a wrench and then um, do everything by hand. Um, doesn't, you know, the little torque to yield uh, screws that hold the injector to the rail assembly, uh, they are only like 44 inch pounds, I think is their torque spec. So not a lot, okay? So um, important that you don't over torque stuff. Um, okay, so what I did when I had the injectors removed is I went ahead and I did an ohms check. So um, I'm going to show you those little snippets of just me um, checking their resistance values against the known good um, at room temperature. So you can see the um, if there's any differences. Keep in mind, I didn't say what cylinder I'm checking. Um, I just say on the next one, here's the next one, here's the next one. Just, just I can tell you when I do ohms checks, I always go in order by cylinder number. So one, the first one I check is cylinder one, two, three, four, so on and so forth. Okay, so let's check that out. Let's do a quick ohms check on those old injectors just to see. So we got 1.6 on that one. 1.7 on the next one. 1.6 on our next one. And we'll do our final one here. And about 1.7, 1.6 on that one. So let's compare that to a brand new one. 1.6. So there you have it. All right, so nothing too fancy, just a quick resistance measurement on the old injectors since I had them out. Might as well get a resistance measurement on them um, and then do a resistance measurement on the brand new one so that if we ever do down the road need that, um, at least we have an idea now. We can always reference this future, um, you know, for future use, which is nice. You know, it's nice to know what a known good is and... Um, you know, whenever I take something apart that I've condemned or said needs to be replaced, I want to like at least take that extra little bit of time and learn something from it. And that goes with anything. If I'm tearing down a transfer case because I think it's got some kind of noise or whatever, I want to see, you know, I want to see why. And the only way to do that sometimes, guys, is to take that little bit of extra time. I know it's hard to do, um, but that's really the only way we learn. Anyways... <clears throat> Unfortunately, I didn't film the assembly of this. I just, you know, I didn't really have the time to do it. I, well, I do, I suppose I could set a camera up and then um, edit that in. You know, just it's a lot of editing to do that because I end up with hours and hours of film. Um, but I'm, I'm working on it like everyone else in this industry. It's tough to do that when you're trying to get the jobs done. Um, nevertheless, I got the I got the important part. I got some data captures of known a known good car um, after repair, and uh, and I captured these trims and some of these um, data pids in their learning state, um, and the corrections um, were being made to the trims. So I thought it was pretty interesting. It was a learning experience for me. Hopefully somebody gathers something out of this and that's ultimately the goal out of this video is to help others learn. Um, this is how I learn. Um, and the best way to learn is look at a known good multiple times so that you know what good looks like. So when you do see bad, you, you know, it stands out to you. So let's get into it. All right, so the injectors are in. I've already changed the oil, so we're about to do some resets and check our repairs here. Let's go ahead and turn the ignition to on. Okay. And let me fire up uh, tuck line, connect. All right, so we're connected. I'm just gonna do a quick run of the DTCs and then I'm gonna dump the codes before we get started. All right, all these codes set because I had the battery disconnected during the injector install. So we're just gonna go to clear DTCs. 
and let them it'll just wipe them all out for us what we're gonna look at is um, I'm gonna do a few resets before um, before we look at fuel trims but I'm gonna do a couple you know learn resets stuff like that um, and then we'll look at fuel trims and what I want to see is um, I want to see immediate correction so I want to see you know really positive trims on the short-term side countering the long-term side and that'll tell me that um, we did in fact fix our rich condition of course we'll run a drive cycle to confirm that that p0172 doesn't reset okay everything's cleared out so let's go into gds2 and we're going to go into module let's go into the engine um, let's come down to configuration reset functions let's start with reset functions we're just going to reset our oil life monitor since we did in fact do an oil change Let's back that up and uh, set that to 100%. Of course, we could do that um, the other way. We could use our um, we could use our info display to do that as well. But I'm just going to do it while I've got the scan tool here. All right, so there we go. And you can see here, current value is set at 99%. So it did take. Let's go back. We'll confirm that on the driver information display as well. So what we want to reset here, I basically want to reset everything. So I'm going to reset the intake learns, the intake system learn values. I'm going to do this reset real quick. I'll activate it. So that's going to relearn that. You can see right now it's in a commanded state of active, so we'll back out. And we're going to reset our, his, our heater O2 sensor heater reset. We'll put that in a learn state. Um, and then fuel rail pressure relief valve learn values reset. We'll go ahead and do that as well. And there you go. And that should be good. You can see some of the other resets they offer in here. Um, we did. I did clean out the throttle body. I guess I can reset that as well. Okay. All right. So let's go back. Let's go into learn functions. See what's in there. Um, we can do a variation relearn, um, heater learn. So let's put that in the learn. And go back. So I'm not going to do any other learns. Um, I mean, I can do a crank position variation relearn once it warms up, of course. So let's go back. I'm going to turn off the ignition. All right. And while I'm in here, we're going to just pull up data. We're going to scroll down now. The trims will be a little little off because I put all the resets on, but um, I just want to look at trim data. And there's our short term and our long term right there. So let's go ahead and start it up. I'll let it just sit here and idle. <clears throat> and we're not in closed loop yet. Uh, that's hood position, in case you're wondering, but, um, there we go. You can see the negative short term. The trims are negative in the short term. That's, that's that stored memory. So I want to see that start to go positive. I'm going to let it sit here and run for a while. Might have to drive it. So 
update it but again it's 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 learning right now so just let the o2s do their thing you can see now we're right about zero and we're coming a little positive so that's that's what i wanted to see so we're just going to let everything idle till it gets up to operating temp i suppose we can lock this data for our test drive um Let's see here so we have it let's lock our short term up to the top let's lock our long term up to the top um, we could take a peek at some o2 data i suppose you can see here field trim system test state running we're in closed loop um, we'll lock our O2's up just for the sake of looking at data. These trims look a lot better already, but again, we're still in learn state on a lot of a lot of things. So, I'm just gonna see if they give us any PIDs here for. Uh, we'll lock our ECT sensor temp on there. Them trims are looking better already. They were considerably negative before, um, pretty much maxed out at like negative 30, negative 35. Just gonna take a quick peek and see if they give us any um, PIDs that tell us whether or not something's been learned or not. You can see we're running fuel pressure on our low side is around 58 PSI and our rail pressure is at about oh 440 ish at idle here and that's about the same as before fuel alcohol content of 10 percent okay test okay okay And then our run time. I'll lock that up there as well. Okay, that should be good. Um, I'll just let this idle here and then I'll get you back. Basically, I'm gonna let it idle until it comes up to operating temperature. Um, I don't wanna mess with anything right now. I don't wanna be revving it or anything. I'm just gonna let it idle and learn. It's a good idle learn. And then once we're up to temp, then we'll take it for a spin and run the rest of the drive cycle. All right, let's take a quick peek at where we're at. We're at 189 degrees. And you can see our trims are eh, slightly negative still, but they are bouncing positive negative. Now, keep in mind, we haven't drove this yet. And... Just because they changed the oil doesn't mean there's not oil, resi you know, residual uh, fuel in the crankcase yet. So like, still got, you know, we've been running 19 minutes, so it's it's gonna take time for that stuff to burn out. Okay. Just real quick, I just wanna come back here. There we are. So you can see here, um, if we come into our inspection slash maintenance system data, status data, it'll tell us, you know, whether or not our monitor is complete on our cat. You can see they're all enabled. Our misfire or our uh, component monitor is passed. So. We're gonna go run the drive cycle until these are all completed. The only ones that I'm probably not gonna be able to complete is gonna be our EVAP. And I'm not too worried about that. Primarily because of the ambient temperature outside. It's like minus, I don't know, like minus 12 out or whatever. 
so it's not going to run the EVAP monitor, but I'm not too concerned about it because I captured um, the status on the monitors before this and I wasn't chasing an EVAP problem. So let me go drive it and get as many of these as passed as possible. And then uh, what we will check is we'll go into the DTCs. Um, we'll see if that P0172 passes this drive cycle, okay? All right, well, the test drive's done. I didn't pass all the monitors, but it's not gonna matter. Thanks to GM, they make this simple, stupid. Um, let's take a quick look and see which ones I actually did pass. So my cat needs to run yet. Um, let's see here. You can see all the ones that have ran and passed. EVAP has not. Fuel system monitor is still not complete. Now that might be concerning to some. Um, I'm not too worried about it. And I'll show you why. And then we got, looks like we got an O2 heater monitor that needs to complete yet. And it might take another ignition cycle for some of these. All right, so let me go back here and I'll show you why this doesn't matter. It's one nice thing about GM. So if we go into our trouble codes menu here and we go to specific DTC, right up here, we're gonna type in our P0172. We're gonna hit show DTC status. And you can see here that's our fuel trim system rich code this ignition cycle passed last test passed since DTC clear passed so we passed the 172 no mills <clears throat> now I could run another drive cycle and see if it passes again to be a hundred percent but what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take a quick cuz I'm short on time let's just look at our data and we'll just run down I'm idling now we're just gonna run down and take a look at them field trims again after driving. Now, on negative 11%, interesting, but it's bouncing positive four. So realistically, um, let's go look at it. Let's look at our trim average once bring this up oh uh, hold on a second so you can see that our average is long-term field trim test average now we're still in you got to remember the field trim system test state is still running okay so it doesn't really know it's still going through a learning process and this can take time guys to burn it into the long-term memory So don't get too concerned if you still see those negative numbers. I'm gonna tell you right now This thing at this point at this temperature after running it this long before was running Minus 30 35 okay It was maxed out the fact that my short-term field trim test average is a positive 2% and my tri my long-term trim average is coming down slowly. You can see as the field trim system test state is running and then, and then it says complete and then it says running and then it says complete. It's determining whether or not I want, see, see there, it just dropped another value. You see that? So as I sit here and idle, you see how it's running right now, the test state? Watch, watch these values change. See how it's still running positive? It's watching them O2s and it's saying, hey, look, these negative trims, these this this test average in the long-term memory of this ECU, it's still burned into its long-term memory from before. And this is telling me that I fixed it, okay? So if I watch, this should just, this should stay positive and it should bring these trims down at an idle um, fuel trim cell, which I think the field trim cell is what, 14? I think we're in field trim, uh, yeah, field trim memory cell 14, which is running at idle. 
okay fully warmed up and you see how they're still running positive the short terms are still positive on our average if we sit here for a while those long-term test averages and there's one without purge and one with purge okay it hasn't ran the purge test yet to finish out the monitor okay but you can see I'm coming down so we'll let it sit here for a few more minutes just to make 100% sure that it's going to continue to go down. And this should change to a negative 8 on our long-term um, field trim test average. It just takes a while for the memory to say, okay, I'm okay with it, I'm bringing it down. And that shows you how long it takes to actually get those learned values burned into memory on these ECUs. There it goes. See how it changed to negative eight now? And we're still positive on our short-term trim average. It, it's testing them O2s to make sure everything is good, okay? So this is a fix, guys. I'm not even worried about it, not one bit at all. Um, it's running great. This will continue to come down, okay? Let's take a look at our um, real-time, short-term, and long-term. So if you ever wonder what those averages are, for those of you out there, th that's what they're used for. Now look at our short-term and our long-term trim. Look at how the short-term is correcting. See that? It's going to end up coming right down to damn near zero. So this is a fix, guys. Well, guys, I hope that you enjoyed that Um I know it got a little lengthy with me talking and stuff, but you know what? I'm not worried about it. It's just the way it's going to be. Um, I took a lot of time to try to put this video together. Hopefully it's helpful for somebody. Hopefully you guys gain something out of it. I know I did. Um, it's a reason I'm sharing this with you. I'll do the best I can with whatever I got. Okay, um, I'm still learning this platform. I'm not perfect at it. Um, there's probably some out there that know more about it than I do. I've read a lot of the bulletins for them and I've been seeing them. So it's just something I wanted to share. Some little project, little hobby I wanted to put together. Um, so like, subscribe, share, whatever you want to do doesn't really matter. Um, the biggest thing is, is if you're learning from it, that's all that I ask, you know, um, gain something from it. Anyways, with that being said, God bless you. Take care. May the Lord uh, watch over you. Um, take care of your family. Hope everyone's doing okay with, you know, economically speaking. Um, and if you and if you're struggling, I, I I'm praying for you. Okay, um, for what it's worth. Um, God bless you. Take care. Thank you for watching, and we'll catch you when I get another video put together.